Thessaloniki, in northern Greece, has turned into a safe haven for Turkish political asylum seekers suspected of links to the Islamist Gulen movement. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan blamed the group for the 2016 coup, resulting in a major crackdown from authorities. But Turkish imam and businessman Fethullah Gulen, Erdogan's main political enemy, denies any involvement. Thousands in Turkey have lost their jobs or been jailed over alleged links to the Gülen movement. Thousands more have chosen self-exile. We are meeting one of them, Musa. Hi, welcome. I want to show you my place and share my story with you. Musa tells us that it was heartbreaking to leave his home country 18 months ago. Together with his wife, Musa opened a small restaurant in the historic centre of Thessaloniki. Before fleeing Turkey, he had a successful construction business and was active in the supervisory board of Gulen schools in Sinop. When the witch hunt against Gulen supporters began, Musa was targeted too, although he did not take part in the failed military coup. I was accused of being a member of a terrorist organization, of helping them financially and managing the Gulen movement. I spent eight months in jail pending trial because of those accusations. The situation in prison was really difficult. We stayed there with 22 people in one tiny cell. It was a really tiny cell. We didn't have enough water and we didn't get enough to eat. No books were allowed, not even the Quran. Arsen shows us the way to a charity shop that's organised by the Gulen Network, where she and her daughter occasionally gets free clothes and food. Arsen has studied chemistry and taught at a Gulen-linked school. During the coup, she and her husband, who was also a teacher, both lost their jobs, so secretly they left the country. Their daughter, Neda, misses her father so much that she needs psychological help. When we were crossing the Evros River, it was so dark, we had to carry our daughter, so we lost all our belongings. When we arrived in Thessaloniki, we had nothing. So in this place here, we found some clothing and other basics for people in need. Her husband then fled to Germany, where he's waiting for a decision on an asylum application for the whole family. Arsen now earns some money doing translations at the Irida Women's Centre. The NGO supports around 300 women from 35 nationalities who have ended up alone with children in the country where they can't speak the language. And the number is on the rise. Hello, welcome to Irida Women's Centre. Come on in. Just yesterday, we registered four new Turkish members. Some of the main challenges we're facing here that our community members are facing are having their educational and job backgrounds recognized so they can start life again here, have access to the labor market. Additionally, the majority of our members are mothers. Their children are going into Greek public schools and uh, facing struggle to learn the language. After the coup attempt, Arsen and her husband were imprisoned for over a year, together with 77,000 other alleged terror suspects. She had to leave Neda, who was 15 months old at the time, with relatives. But it gets worse. I do not think that there's an independent justice system existing in Turkey anymore. In prison, the most difficult situation was to see a woman with her 30-day-old baby. The imprisoned mother didn't have enough milk. The baby was so tiny and thin, it wasn't possible to give it enough food. In a Greek village outside Thessaloniki, we meet Bekir. He worked as a computer teacher at a Gulen-affiliated school. After the coup attempt, he and around 150,000 people were dismissed from their jobs because of alleged links with the Gulen network. Greece granted him protection and his family gets some small financial support from the UN Refugee Agency. I was dismissed following the presidential decree number 672 along with some tens of thousands of other people. 
e, 62 bin kişi gibi suçlu ilan edildim ve hiç I was labeled a criminal. I was not granted my rights to defend myself. I was exposed to a kind of social death. After I was dismissed, two former lawyers of mine were arrested too. Then, in the area where I lived, I called 11 lawyers. Out of those, 10 bluntly refused to look into my case. I see Turkey today as a complete dictatorship. Bekir knows the Quran by heart. His deep faith runs alongside some of the values taught by Fatullah Gulen: priority to education, prayer, and conflict management by dialogue. These two books are about the Prophet Muhammad. One of them is written by Fatullah Gulen. These books are considered evidence of crime right now in Turkey. Personally, when I was still in Turkey, I had to bury seven huge bags of books. Many people who owned these books are in prison now. Yasemin is a mother of four, and she's waiting to be reunited with her husband, who found protection in the US. She also receives a stipend from the UN Refugee Agency. Back in Turkey, she worked as a manager at a student dormitory linked to the Gulen movement. Although schools, groups and NGOs were perfectly legal until the coup d'etat. When the anti-Gulen crackdown started, Yasemin was pregnant. The schools we were working for were closed down. We had arrest warrants issued against us, so we had no opportunity to go to any hospital. When you go to a hospital, you're in their database and they can find and arrest you. To avoid those risks, we decided to give birth at home. When the midwives arrived very early in the morning, they told me not to scream when giving birth. I told them, yes, I know. The following two years, every single day, we were afraid of being arrested. Fearing arrest and with no belief in the independence of the Turkish justice system, thousands of teachers, managers, public servants and businessmen cannot return to their life in Turkey now. Saying goodbye to their home country, they try to start a new life elsewhere in Europe or overseas.